we do this all the time. And, and um, it's very easy to give words and say, oh, you like this because of this. This is the thing that you like about it. And you can really break it down to elements. But this kind of collective idea, which is so strong and so, and, and so clear here, sometimes it's hard to put exactly the, the definition. And how do you explain, like give somebody a roadmap to create that when they've never been here, and at the same time protect that? create that roadmap so other people who come know that, all right, these are the things, these are the um, things that you have to do to continue and to preserve that, that collective kind of definition. So I'm going to let Walt explain that, what the group came up with, because I know they did a lot of wonderful work. Can you hear me in the back without the mic? Or would you like the mic? Hi. We can or cannot? Back row. Well, Use the mic. Okay. The mic. There we go. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure, appreciation for the giant hospitality, again, and appreciation in particular to the roundtable group that I chaired and uh, enjoyed being part of. It was energetic, fast-paced, we had a good time, I had a good time, and I hope it showed. Um, and I think we were productive. In fact, it took essentially the whole day to begin even to digest the piles of material that we generated and then many, many ideas. You're going to look at just the tips of the iceberg, as you already have seen with the other subjects. And these are emotional highlights. It's all they could be at this point, based on the fast pace of what we've done. And it's my emotional connection to certain things, but it may not be your emotional highlights, and your favorite ideas may not be on the screen tonight. But they're not lost, be sure, and we'll be thinking about them. And other highlights may, in fact, raise their way above these uh, as we think more about the subject. Because there's lots to say. It's a pervasive subject, as you know. Go to any community, and one of the first things that gets talked about, as you have in your application, you ask for protection of your rural character. And uh, then it proceeds. We won't go into the details right there, but let the comments that come along bring it out. The first slide you looked at was the hard one open space of um, the, the, the fields that are an accent to an otherwise largely wooded island. And uh, that's an ingredient that got lots of attention. It catches my attention always. And uh, do you want to, I invite you to think as you contemplate this meeting and you're driving around, how important those fields are to you. Are they an asset, as the group began to discover, that has unusual importance? I'm going to just touch a few words in this list. Beauty, it's a place, of, as I've said on the first night, of uncommon beauty. Um, there's an issue about disproportional amount of change. The fact that you're reasonably small and even smaller in numbers, any change, even small ones, can make a disproportionately bigger impact than you might like it to make. And I want to say very quickly on the heels of that, and I'm beginning to hear and know of examples, that disproportionately small individual and small group efforts can concomitantly make great impacts in the positive way. So there's a good side to that particular fact. I want to also comment on the, word, the words intimate and human scale. I know Erica uses the word intimate uh, in her perception of your island, uh, an important one. And it is any wonder why we worry about the word big in any form. Big roads, big buildings, big parking lots, uh, big of any kind, big commerce can be a disruption to what is otherwise an intimate, as we've said, and small human scale place. So you have a right to be worried about big, and we spent some time, by the way, talking about big buildings and homes, and I'm not going to talk about it tonight. It was an especially rich discussion. We went beyond the platitudes and got at issues of what it was that it really meant, that was the, what were the fears around that subject, and we identified three or four big ones and talked about what, would, what could do, one could do about that, and that's going to be in the report. So, anyway, and there's a non-common uh, amount of diversity in uh, the island's people. When you think of rural character, next please, you think both of people and place in combination. We did talk about, uh, I asked as an early exercise in our group to have people identify the community's character, what it meant to, leave, to live here, and have you especially to really resonate in your own understanding of why it's important to you. Um, someone said, and it caught many of us our attentions, that 
In some ways, the island selects you rather than you selecting it. It seemed to be true for several people around the table, if not many, and uh, it's caught my attention for sure. The idea of self-sufficiency, of being, having an intelligent and gregarious group of people that are, on the, for the most part, inclusive, was important. Other things said, not on your slide, um, unusual freedom of choice, relaxed, safe, are the prevailing feelings that many of us have living here. Weymouth is often uh, is, offers an authentic, helpful, stress-reduced way of living. Can you resonate with that? Next, please. Um, the vision is essentially a, a massaged uh, GPAC vision that was just so well done that it articulated both the qualities that I just mentioned and others, so we won't dwell on it, but um, other than to say that it really began to talk about three important words, a system of open space and wetland, and I'd like you to contemplate that word, system, and a, a, a different variations in rural density. And some of the things that we're going to be talking about, we think that has to be entertained, and if you really contemplate it, you really have a range of rural densities currently. And they can be done well. And slow-paced, which means controlled growth. I'll move to the next slide, please. We did an exercise that was called Places of the Heart. It's a, it's a process that Randy Hester of California, a landscape architect, started long ago, but it resonates and works. It's essentially a rapid-fire questioning of ourselves without any kind of prompting. What comes to mind when we think of our place? How do we name it? and especially what are the important places to us as we work and live our daily lives. And the exercises went through a few things. You can see some of the things that were named. Let it be known that there's both built and natural. Not a surprise that the natural were the predominant pieces that were appreciated here, but it wasn't to the exclusion of the places where you come together. So it's good to see that that's true. And the ferry is a big player. It's a big part of the facilitating of the community as landfills and other kinds of facilities are in other communities where or the post offices are. <laughs> so, so it's a kind of rapid response. Next, please. And um, we'll move on to community strengths. Um, in terms of... Um, Concerns and knowledge for Guaymas is certainly an impressive fact that so many of you are on top of that. There's a broad ranging and broad capacity to explain who you are and why it's important. You exhibit what I would call a good deal of innocence in a, what is, could be said as an authentic, mindful way of life. Uh, the, the casualness and the un, unpretension of the way you live is certainly impressive to me as it is, I think, to many people. Many of your homes and life is hidden, as I said on the first night, which is a surprise. So it really plays to the fact that you cherish your independence and ability to be so, but at the same time are willing on the right ways and occasions to be part of community. So the business of community and privacy seems to be achieved and potentially balanced here. And each of us have to measure whether that's true for ourselves, if you, or you are in fact living here. We, um, Move next, please. There are some threats, certainly, to uh, this character, and these are only a few, and they may not be all that are important to be on this list. But it has been said in the group that you have been discovered, or are being more discovered, in recent times. So there's an acceleration of notoriety. There's a doubling, as, was, uh, as Jeff pointed out, in terms of the number of residential construction starts, uh, just in very recent year or two. The amount of buildable land available is um, um, intimidating. Oh, the, oh, the amount of buildable, I'm sorry, there we go, it's too late and I'm under an angle. Um, we were told by Roz the first evening the number of uh, available units both on the shoreline and inland, and we know maybe not every one of those could be built, but the proportion of a tripling, as I read it, uh, is a pretty impressive fact. And, Will the aquifer certainly uh, withstand that, and will the rural character in this way of life withstand anything close to that level of, of change? The prime land resources of the island and its shoreline 
are tended by folks who are on the, whether they want to be there or not, on the elder end of the scale. And it means that in a rather short period of time, there will be a transition, a transference to family members, or selling and new people coming, many maybe not with the same initial values, you hope to inculcate those in them if they come, but there's going to be change on the two most precious resources you own. That's the shoreline and the farm and open fields internally. And so big changes at hand is one of the reasons you want to keep your antenna up and keep coming to meetings to deal with this inevitable change. And there, there was lots of discussion, and it ended up being called the collective we, that it was known to many, and even with the disappointments of being rejected, that a voice is stronger if it's a collective voice, and the we uh, needs to be exaggerated and improved and enhanced and from the island. And certainly we're going back, not the least, but the diversity of people um, is under siege as well in the island in terms of additional threat. Middle income people, affordable housing, having elder of the community be able to stay longer on this island, the place they love so much, uh, but not having the choice to be able to do that. That's something I think you ought to be thinking of and how to provide services even for the young folks. Maybe there's a preschool possibility or something like that. So looking at both ends of the spectrum and the middle as well in terms of serving all the age groups that are needing to be served. Next. Some recommendations, and these are just single recommendations of what are at this moment a much longer list and not sorted terribly well, but uh, they're exemplary only. First of all, there need to be studies, and you've heard that from the other presentations this evening. Studies of particular kinds. When it comes to rural character, understanding what that character is, there are ways to do that, and it's in the process of doing it, you really are participating in another version of what we're seeing tonight, that is community, making it happen and understanding yourselves. In fact, I'd like to suggest that going backwards and looking internally rather than across the channel or looking outward to the county and the pressures that come from the world economy, etc. cetera, uh, and understanding yourselves well is almost the best thing you can do to fend off pressures and change. Having facts, as has been said already tonight, and understanding yourselves well and having a passion, an articulate passion for it, has already impressed us, is the best thing you can do. Programs and policies are also needed, and there are many of them that we can think of, some of them you've heard that we've also discovered in our session. But develop an expensive and inclusive and welcome wagon is one that I uh, maybe as co-authored and want to put forward. It seems to me that this island You've just done it for us, so maybe that's why it's so impressive. Have made, it, made us feel so welcome, so quickly. And if every person who's even contemplating who are, or is in fact coming to the island ha is welcome, that there's a sustained practice, there's a buddy system so that over a period of a year you, you make people who are brought into the community and be, are made, uh, made aware of what it has to offer and the way you like to live and why it's important to live that way, all of those personal things have the best potential of impacting in a positive way the rural character and the way of life you have. So rather than waiting for it to happen by some chance meeting, it, it, you've got something to offer that's really great. You have a great pride in it. Take it to the, to the front door and shake, send your hand out to introduce yourself to those folks. Next. Summary points. Uh, inward introspection has a larger part in this solution, as I've already intimated. Going backwards before going forward seems to me to be one of the things you want to do. Think more strongly and carefully about yourself. Look at your architectural heritage. You've got at least a couple of different vernaculars uh, uh, on the island. Uh, what are they? What Can you create uh, uh, award programs? As, maybe something we didn't mention on the list here, but it was mentioned in the meeting, to honor successes in terms of site planning, in terms of building, making the, bringing the pride to the folks who've done it and to the community at large around you. Embracing um, contemporary directed growth provisions. Directed growth, this is something I did want to say to the larger group, that having looked at planning for a good number of years, there's a way to think about what's happened with planning and zoning, and there's a good deal to be skeptical about, and I share that. But initially, before planning, 
got going, whenever something was done and it worked, you replicated it. You're, you borrowed from your neighbor's experience and wisdom and did it over again. Soon life became a little more complex, there were more people, the landscape that was being occupied was a little more complex as well. And so we ended up with what is currently called the standards approach to planning, and that includes zoning. That, where, that is where you have a rule book and you can flip to page 43 and see what it says and see if the proposal is meeting those expectations. But we know that the landscape, just based on the discussion of aquifers and anything that we've talked about tonight, is much more complex than that rule book can anticipate. And in zoning, minimums are become maximums. What has been transpiring in this country over the recent latter part of my career, and it's exciting, is something that we could collectively call directed growth planning where you set up minimum rules that bring the proposer a change to a table for a discussion, just like we discussed for this, this community. And you have a re, a, you work through with certain regulations at your hand and a site plan review and a reasonable basis and a reasoned basis, a better reversion of what might be being proposed. And this community has some of those things, but not a lot. And I think it needs to look at those alternatives, those own directives, growth alternatives where you are in fact directing your own growth. And they're there for you to Excuse contemplate you. Yes? Uh, we need to go down. People that have to be on the ferry, we're going to run a shuttle down. Okay. Please feel free and thank you for those of you who have to leave. Okay, next slide please. And so we move to the, uh, the area of So those who need to leave on the ferry are asked to catch the shuttle and you'll be taken right down. So I'm going to end with that saying again an appreciation. It's a subject that's pretty extensive and as has already been said, there's going to be a lot more uh, material in the report and about some of the important topics that you are wrestling with on a daily basis. But it uh, wouldn't have been there without the great support and uh, good ideas of the folks that sat in the team that I worked with. Thanks. Sustainability is a mindset, and you as an island, as a group, as a collective presence here are the champions of that sustainability and of that vision. Um, you, what sustainability is, it's really a way of looking. It's not, it's not just one thing. It's sort of, it's a vision, it's a goal that you set that keeps getting higher and higher as time goes by. It's going to have to, otherwise none of us are going to survive on this planet for much longer. Um, but it is a, a focal point, an end point, or a direction that you take, a course that you set as a community, as individuals, as small groups, whatever. And um, grassroots tools are really the critical, which is what you've already done here with all, all this work and by bringing us here. But these grassroots tools are really the critical approaches and the critical success for this. And we're seeing this all around the country. We know on federal level this hasn't happened, but on a grassroots level there are communities all around the country who are thinking sustainably and taking control of their futures, of their, of their place, of their towns, of their communities, and really making sure that the quality of life they have now is here for the future, for their um, future generations and descendants. And if it's not as good it is, as it is now, it's even better. Um, Gwyneth Island, you can all come together around the sustainable future. One thing, um, there has been a lot of, of dis disagreement and discussion around issues, but it's really now time to heal those old wounds and agree that you are going to disagree on things, but that you're all going to agree on trying to be sustainable and find solutions that are sustainable. And again, the ferry, it just gets you here, but it doesn't build a home and it hasn't built your place. This island existed long before the ferry 
And as you all know, when the ferry's down, you're still surviving and you're still making do very creatively, very inventively, and as a community. So um, I think it's really, really important in relation to the county, the rest of the world, and to your success when you look for partners and support, be it with funding or regulation, that you put a face on this island, that people know who you are. That's very, very important. The county government does not need to be your enemy if you're proactive, if you get more people involved on different boards, either from the island directly or friends in the rest of the county. That's really important. This happens across the country, but um, what you find with any kind of government, be they inspectors, um, county regulators, whatever, if you proactively go and offer input and help in, in a partnership term, and do it before things have started, like a great example is the ferry, I think you can have a lot more success and get a lot more things done and see your vision implemented much more um, effectively and much more supportively. Everybody always has a fear of the unknown, and if, if you stay as strangers, everyone's going to think, oh, those guys on the island, they're crazy. I had an interesting conversation with Steve Cox yesterday. I was... I said I was sorry to have missed him the first time he was here. I heard he was out of town. And he said, no, I wasn't out of town. I didn't want to come and see those guys. I was so angry, I did not want to come and see them. I didn't want to see any of you. So I was like, oh, boy, that's too bad. But I said, we're from, we're from out of the country. We want to, we're from out of the area. We want to see you. And so I thanked him for coming, and I appreciated the effort he made. And then I was able to have this conversation with him. And he left at lunch, and then he came back, and he said, you know, I wasn't sure I was going to come back because I was still really angry. But in the end, I changed my mind. And I came back, and I was happy I did. And it gave me the opportunity to have that conversation with him. And I said, so what's your vision for all of this? He says, well, if I could do what I wanted and have the county commissioners listen to me, this is the plan I would have. And it was amazing. It was a sustainable vision for the fair. It was a start. He said, you know, um, Whatcom County has to buy a, a, a ferry, a new boat. If we buy the two together, together it's going to be a lot cheaper than us just buying one. Then we can retire one and we can share it for backup. That's sustainable vision. Because he understands what a pain it was for all of you to be without that ferry. And he doesn't want to be in that position of having to answer that. So he is thinking. And I think there is an opportunity there, the fact that now he made a big effort to come here that I know it's very, very hard, and maybe it's going to take a little time for everyone to just kind of heal those wounds, and time has a way of healing things. But I'm, I'm bringing this up, and I had a similar conversation with the commissioner, I'm bringing this up to not give up on these guys. And to really, I know, I hear the chuckles, and I can understand, I've gotten angry and worked up about things too. Anybody who knows me can tell you lots of stories about that. But sometimes it's not productive. But it's okay. It's normal. Give yourself some time, but then really go around. Commissioner Monks was incredibly impressed with this process and saying, you know, this is this is a fantastic process. I want to see this around the country. Can you around the county? Can you guys come back next year and help us with this problem, that problem? He said, this is really the way to work. This is the way to get things happen to happen. So give us some time, but. Give, that, give yourselves that opportunity to explore that option. Um, I really believe all of you are an incredible resource, a role model to others, an inspiration to others. Form those partnerships with other communities who are also struggling like you. There is power in numbers, be they communities in the county, in the state, or in the rest of the country. There are a lot of people out there doing things like that. Even though I must admit, you're pretty unique. I'd say you're on the top of the list. But definitely reach out. There's a lot of... Um, positive things that can happen in that process. Again, sustainability is not about losing, it's about gaining, gaining for all of you. Can I have the next slide, please? And then the next steps, um, there are, uh, we understood there are a lot of clubs, groups, um, committees on the island. Uh, organizing an oversight committee might be something very, very useful that um, reports back, at least in relation to sustainability, especially since you have these different topics, and they do all overlap in a way. But it would be great for that committee that, to report back on an annual basis or in some form to all residents on maybe you create an annual sustainability report and you highlight and celebrate your achievements, your milestones, your, your targets that you've um, reached, um, and, and that can, can 
go across all boards, even this, something as small as recycling or a lot bigger things. And we'll have more recommendations around that in the report. Again, um, forge partnerships with your allies, the Samish tribe, your neighbors across the waterway in Atlanta Cordes, other sub areas in the county, and then other communities beyond. Um, again, I already mentioned the county staff. Um, in the toolkits, I mentioned earlier that we will have some recommendations for um, what could what those toolkits can contain. I think all of you as a group, having been through this process, that is something in your little subcommittees you could begin to develop. And then again, um, goals, targets, milestones for all of you, be they personal, individual goals that you set and that you measure sort of your sustainability against that, against those goals and those targets, and you continue that ongoing questioning about what you're doing, um, be it about construction, about building, about transportation, all these issues we have discussed. It's really important to keep that questioning open and opening and you keep, as you do that, you enlarge your vision further and further and you find more and more alternatives and options and ways to do things creatively. Um, and again, just remember that sustainability is a very inclusive vision and it is a way to bring people together. And it's okay, again, to disagree, but in sustainable solutions you have a rich complexity that can bring opposites together. So I want to, um, I think I will pass the mic on to Anne. She's going to do some the official thank you. But I will, because I didn't have a chance to say, I want to thank all of you for welcoming us. And again, I repeat what everybody else said already. But thank you for feeding us so well. But basically, thank you for opening your hearts up to us and letting us share a piece of your wonderful island life here. volunteers and have left their paying jobs and loved ones um, to be here because they're so inspired by um, your guys' nice passion for your community. So, thank you all. Uh, also, please forgive our, our typos and whatnot. Um, some of you saw us running out of the library. We literally were putting the last slides in as, as we ran out here. Um, I'll proof the report more carefully. Um, we had so many ideas, we didn't have time to slow down for that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you to the community as well, especially Roz and um, the rest of the <laughs> as well. You've all been very kind. Um, at this point, we'd like to take any questions you all have or any comments. Uh, you're the quickest on the draw. I haven't even sworn to yet. Not yet. <laughs> I've heard some things that I've kept to myself, but I haven't yet been sworn to secrecy. Regarding the island being here. Bad weather, <laughs> bad, weather bad food, terrible yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, yes, we will post it online at www.ana.org slash LIV underscore SDAT. In fact, we've been writing daily stories uh, about our experience here in Greenness, and those are posted already here. You're certainly welcome to use those. It'll be on my it It'll be on our website. You guys can post on your website, and we'll be sending back to Roz probably somewhere between 250 and 300 copies. Um, for your use as well. A question for the water committee. Did you talk about the uh, salt water uh, systems? Yeah. No, the salt water systems that are. Reverse systems. osmosis? Yeah, thank you. Yes. And whether that can be expanded to other areas of the island? Um, there's certainly a possibility that it could be expanded. However, there were some 
concern raised amongst the uh, uh, members of the roundtable with regards to a couple of things. And, and uh, this will be detailed a little bit more in the report, but just very briefly. Uh, one is that it appears that that particular technology, at least as it exists right now, is not adequately being used uh, on the North Shore. Uh, it's, uh, it's my understanding, and I may be wrong in what I heard or or understood from the from the gathering of folks, but it's it's only running a part of the time, and uh, it seems as though there could be more fresh water provided uh, either to other members of the community uh, through sale or whatever the case might be to make that a more efficient process. And then the other whole issue with reverse, reverse osmosis is the fact that the salt has to go someplace, and uh, that that can create a real problem, especially if that technology is is expanded without uh, a mindful eye and uh, some sort of monitoring and, and uh, uh, standard setting because uh, certainly the marine environment uh, can't, uh, can't handle a lot of excessive salts going in at, at, in a point source kind of fashion and certainly the land can't handle it and, and all that will do is spoil the freshwater resources that you already possess naturally. So there are some issues that certainly need to be considered and the sensitivity given to in terms of expansion of that technology in the future. Yes. Well, I wonder if uh, uh, the problem of air pollution came up and was discussed. One thing we have here about three months of the year is the southeast wind, which brings the refineries pollution over onto the island and affects us 24 hours a day. There was actually one thing that came up. It's that that's a problem in a lot of communities where you have a source off, either offshore. I don't know what the exact term is, but you have sources of pollution that are, that you don't have control over. Um, but you do have control as a lobbying group, and that's that's one thing that you can start doing as you really become a, a force in the region and a model of sustainability. Um, and in a lot of things that you're doing, and you are going to be, you're going to become the reference, um, I think, for a lot of things in a lot of ways. But you have, you can start leveraging some power as in lobbying, and that's, you know, we can't, and the other thing is to stop supporting that by encouraging use of alternative fuels. I mean, that's the biggest thing that's, the demand's still, still there, and you're fighting against everybody else who still wants their, their car and their fuel source, so. The AIA has been running design assistance programs since 1967. Um, yes, we've done now 138 RUDAP programs, which is a more traditional sort of smart growth or urban design type of program. The SVATs were new starting last year because we as an institute or organization decided that really um, we should take it kind of up to that next level and start working on sustainability, um, kind of step it up a notch as it were. You guys are the eighth completed SVAT. So all told, we've done almost 150 of very similar programs with slightly different themes all across the nation, a few in Canada, one in Guam, and uh, a few other sort of assorted places, but um, certainly not the first, and nowhere near the last, we hope. <laughs> Any other questions, comments?
And the only word I ended up using in the presentation was the, the, the affordable and alluded to the young and the old, but the whole notion of really taking that on, it seems as a community you cannot sidestep it. And if, if the values of, um, of uh, property keep going up and some folks can't stay on their property, then there's a concern about that. So making opportunities at all levels and ways to uh, keep the diversity that you have and bring more of it uh, is important. And there are many ways to do it, and we certainly didn't give it justice at all, other than uh, raising it as an important topic. Uh, as I said, we did talk about bigger homes and what that meant and why the fear was wrapped around that so, so strongly, and uh, that got us into the discussion even more, but not in a focused way. Uh, uh, Carl, some of the conversations we had uh, this morning and I think yesterday touched on it, not in, a, in an organized way. Um, we see that as, as a critical issue. It didn't fit very easily in, into any of the categories. That's why it may not have been addressed as importantly as it, as it should be. Uh, some of the ideas that were bounced around, uh, one, there, there are different ways of uh, providing housing, uh, uh, garage apartments, detached uh, units that are small. Uh, there would have to be a willingness of, of those that are building them to provide them. Uh, or as a community to undertake a, a, a construction of some compact units. Uh, there are a lot of ways to address it. Uh, we even talked about the age issue. Uh, I think uh, Erica had an interesting anecdote I let her share with you that I thought was really uh, neat about some interested young folk. Uh, but it certainly is worth a discussion and probably some creative ideas about housing and about jobs the uh, uh, community-supported agriculture could provide uh, if a plot were arranged or purchased. Uh, the, the, the caretaking of that might be a job or a couple of jobs. The caretaker and her family or whatever could be, you know, you could start doing those things in a small way, but that unfortunately was about the limit of some of the ideas we addressed. We, we equally feel that that's a really important deal. And, uh, uh, and I guess the last thing I would add would be the openness to think about families and some of the changes that they could bring to you. Families tend to like larger footprints of houses. Families tend to like resources that are different that aren't really apparent here. So the welcoming of this diversity does need to accommodate some uh, enlightenment and provision that is different, but it doesn't mean it has to impact everyone. It could be something selective that, that you're sure you're providing for the younger families. Dave, did you want to add anything? Uh, okay, I know, I, I do have to say, we all, we did touch on that in each group when we were doing our, kind of our discussions among ourselves and looking at how things interrelate. And I know I had a small conversation with Dave about different, um, different small business, small home business things that people could be doing around energy on the island. Um, but what was interesting, the thing that um, Glenn alluded to, I spoke earlier with Leslie East, Eastbrook. Is she here? Or Leslie, are you here? Oh, that's too bad. She, she pointed out something interesting, because all along since we've been here, we've been having conversations about the sage population and, and of course, the men of Guaymas and the other single, <laughs> single folks here and, and these, these wonderful, you know, there are young people on this island um, that have great ideas and there are young single people. And it was interesting, when the Samish tribe came over, there were a lot of young people rowing over here. And they came back here and they were saying, and this Leslie was relating to me, and they said, wow, this is a wonderful place. I could really, I feel like I belong here. I feel like this place is calling me here. I would love to live here. So, who knows? <laughs> interesting, some interesting partnerships. But there are, there are young people who do, who do want to live here and start families. And I, some of them were, still, were here already, have, have shown. Um, but there is, there is really an issue, this is across the country, of aging populations and how do you keep that um, age diversity and one thought that we were, we were discussing was this kind of unintentional co-housing. Do any of you know what the co-housing model is? Um, and, and basically it's, it's, it has a lot of interests in different ways economically, socially and also the use of, of land and resources but basically you can have small houses and you're sharing um, 
many things that normally people have in duplication. Um, you're, you're sharing and you're buying only a few lawnmowers, for example, or just one, or it's things like that, or bicycles, or cars, or um, gardening. They're, they're doing one big garden for the community. Um, but that's, that's a possibility to address needs of families that then evolve and turn into needs for elderly that don't need as much space, but maybe um, housing can be divided up into uh, multifamily, or you can have provide large, more spaces like your community room, but around clusters of houses, so you're, not everybody needs a big house with multiple things where they're only in that space at one time. The um, I'd like to, have to add just one more comment that occurs to me, and that is that as a person who works with co-housing and clustered, and have mentioned in this context the directive growth, which is a part of that, all these alternatives, that I would encourage you to have an open mind. I can see no better place to have small, appropriate scale clusters, sustainable, that really model what you're after, and have them contribute to and in no way detract from your character. So there are opportunities out there that you need to be looking at and you need to satisfy all the skepticism and you need to have it. But look at the alternatives there. I assure you they are there. And this kind of landscape is very tolerant for that situation. And so I would hope it's included in the options you at least investigate and hopefully embrace. And from strictly an economic point of view, there are many things that uh, you as a community, because you are so ingenious anyway, and have very vivid imaginations. Many of the things that you do here, either in a retired capacity or, I'll, I'll, I'll use the example since she was so kind to give me one of her products, uh, the, the production of fruit trees and, and, and what is done with that fruit. Uh, obviously one of the things that could be done is the fruit could be sent off to a market uh, on the mainland or something like that. But she chooses to add value to her fruit. Uh, she processes it here, creates jellies and jams and, and uh, a number of different products. And there are many small home-based businesses and other kinds of agricultural and industrial activities where you can add value to products before you send them someplace else and benefit rather than somebody else benefiting from that. And in the process, you are in most cases providing a job for somebody. Uh, and, and as an example, uh, resort communities face the same kind of aged age difference and economic class difference that uh, you, you are experiencing here uh, in a smaller way. And the way these resort communities, especially those that are necessarily demand as much money but need something to be able to buy the food and the, and the housing and so forth that, that exists in that area. So adding value to the things that you do here normally uh, through, through one kind of economic process or another is a, is a way to aid young families and to encourage the settlement of young families to continue the legacy uh, with the same kinds of values that you possess. There's also another thing that we didn't mention was the CSA. This island actually, you have 800 full-time residents could support actually a few CSAs. They're usually about 250, 300 people. They're CSAs, community supported agriculture, and that would be um, a job for a farmer and his family, and plenty of work for summertime apprentices. Um, Etc. that could come through for learning our opportunities. So, and you do have land on the island that could do that. So, yeah, I, I don't have a question. I'd like to make a comment, and I, I'm going to try to make it brief and pointed. But uh, I started school in this room. Uh, it was a kindergarten room, and um, I've been with this island in many different formats for a long time. Uh, some of my professors and uh, uh, other academic situations said that uh, the kindergarten here might have been my highest uh, moment of achievement. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to follow that comment by two other endeavors that I've been involved in on the island. Uh, one is uh, this document, which is the first sub-area plan. I suppose you've seen that. It's dated May 18, 1991. Uh, it's 15 years later. And I want to thank you for coming back and helping us to start the second sub-area plan. The first one, we were told we were too early by the county. Uh, the reason that you're here is that when the sub-area plans began to be started uh, a little bit in reverse in the county, uh, we were not recognized at all. Um, as a matter of fact, we applied uh, and they said, oh, well, you have to get at the end of the list and uh, you might get funding in 2005. Well, you know it's 2006 and we didn't get any funding yet. 
again, I think that your contribution here in bringing together a lot of energy is very valuable. This is the hydrogeologic study of, of the island. I'm sure you've seen that. Uh, and at one point, I was very hopeful that um, that this would really help us uh, uh, focus uh, on, on the major thing that you've uh, brought up again, which is that we have a pretty uh, a fragile water situation here. Uh, this was done before my well failed. Uh, my well has failed. And uh, a lot of uh, my neighbor's wells have failed on North Beach. Uh, I can also tell you that the county was approached at one point uh, before the um, that, that there was a failure of a major system on West Beach, which, which now is our reverse osmosis system. They got a letter from the EPA in 96 asking for a moratorium uh, on uh, single well drillings until the saltwater intrusion issue could be addressed. Um, the net result of that was that that letter went from uh, state uh, EPA to the Skagit County Health Department the result was that the health department was taken out of the permitting process for building. Um, Carl Cady counted the number of meetings. I, I, I'm bringing up these two issues because I, I, I feel a sense of personal failure here. Um, and this relates to my academic uh, comment earlier. <laughs> but, um, I had great hopes for the first area plan, and I have great hopes for the second. I had uh, great hopes for this study. Um, Carl, Katie, and I, uh, and, and several other people served on the ferry committee, and we, Carl counted the number of meetings, 62 meetings. 62 meetings in a year and a little bit more. Now, we worked very hard with Mr. Monks and Mr. Cox, and we had, uh, I would say, some very tactful, uh, persistent, hardworking, dedicated people on that committee, and today we're in a lawsuit with the county. So, um, over, over these issues that were brought up time and time again, uh, it was very interesting to hear your proposal about the free passengers. We proposed that during one of these 62 meetings. But it didn't make it either. Um, so, I think we have a real problem here. Only one speaker mentioned how to go forward. That was the geek. <laughs> Uh, we're going to get, uh, I, I think we're in an end game for Guimas, and we have so little control in it that the failure that, that I feel part of is that we have to address whether we have a government here on the island. I hate that idea because of the independence that, that draws people to this island, but I think if we don't coalesce and form some kind of a sub-government unit, it's a city or a um, I, I don't know the right legal uh, framework for it, and I think it will be hard to do. Uh, there is another agenda for this island, and that agenda is to develop it. And we are not part of the agenda in that we cannot afford the new level of pricing that will come into this island. And we will, we in the middle class, as you have pointed out, we will probably not be able to retire here. And I think if we can't come together and, and form some kind of a governmental unit, our ability to withstand the, uh, the plan that is uh, afoot for this island will, will, uh, will not survive. Here, here. So um, it's, we don't have all the answers. 
We don't. Um, we definitely don't. But um, I think one thing again is you do have. Um, there are uh, provisions in the County Comprehensive Plan and in the Growth Management Act and with EPA and your sole source aquifer designation that if you start adding all these things up and hit it on all fronts and make a hell of a lot of noise on all levels, I think that, you know, is maybe going to get you somewhere. And then you also, as a community, have to strategize how you can gain control of these lands yourself. On um, Nantucket Island off the coast of Massachusetts was faced with the same thing and it was threatening their water supply, it was threatening everything and they, they um, created a transfer tax, property transfer tax and within a year because of the way things were selling up, just a year of sales they were able to start acquiring land and put it in preservation and the whole community voted for that and supported that and that's been working very, very well. Um, those kind of strategies I think you're going to have to look at. If properties are selling in the millions you know, somebody can afford a multi-million dollar property, um, a 5%, 10% tax, whatever. I don't know how high you, you can legally go, but that's something to look into. That can start filling up the, cop the coffers very quickly. And one of your first steps should, should be to start identifying what those parcels are and what those areas are that you need to gain control of for your water, protection of your water, et cetera. Everybody has a right to clean water. There's no reason to bring a pipeline over here. So that's also, you really have to start making a lot of noise on that. But you're right, we don't have the answers and it is incredibly frustrating. All we can say is you've got to hit it on all fronts and, and find those allies everywhere else. That, and, it, and it might be, they might have different issues that you can support them on and they can support you, but you've got to start for, forging those alliances. I think that's going to be the only way because we all know what elections do and 800 is a small number when it comes to votes. So. <laughs> Also, I just want to pick up on what you said because, you know, it really did come out in our meeting, in our roundtable, you know, the issue of, you know, free fares. Also came out that you had the plans and they are, they are there. And you, you really have to look upon yourself, I would say, not as a failure, but as a futurist. And that's happened to all of us. Um, you know, you're a little bit ahead of the game sometimes. But the game keeps catching up with you. And I think what you might have seen, and, and I think some of what we've seen from what you just said, that it's starting to catch up in terms of what you did back in 91. You know, today, 15 years later, some of that's coming, still coming, and it's coming together. And so what you don't want to do is to, uh, is to feel like you failed, but just feel like you have been leading. And, and continue that leadership, and continue to bring more people in with the informing that leadership and working on this. That's you know that's that's what brings the success and uh, and, and I think that's that's where we're all from in, in terms of, of being here and I just want to make one final statement myself just for being here you know uh, I really hope that all of you will share what you what you've learned kind of things that happened your ideas from our sessions and uh, share with each other continue to share with us what what you you know what we what we kind of accomplished during this, these last few, few days. And uh, I know there's one thing that, you know, I kind of wanted to share with you that I'm taking away from here. interest and goodness knows it goes with sustainability and it's right in your vernacular here you have good reason to be thinking about that and creating a strategy and I recommend and we'll give to anybody who wants to title 
a book about the town of Lincoln, Mass., which might be an inspirational story to some of you, by Robert Lemire talking about Bridge to the Future, where they really created such a plan, the best that I know of, and proceeded step by step to make it happen on their own initiative. So it can happen, and that's the message I'd like to leave. I'm going to give you my thanks. Uh, I do not have a t-shirt underneath, and I don't think you want me to take the shirt off. <laughs> no, I think I do have a t-shirt on I, I was inspired uh, uh, by David's idea of an acronym. He, he created the Geeks. Uh, since I'm with, uh, well, since I was with the Open Space, the, the group that I think we ought to create, and I'll let you figure out the acronym, uh, Gwemis Open Space Specialists in Planning. Okay, well, that one I'm going to let you know. <laughs> anyway, we, I'd like to thank you very much. It's been a, a, an incredibly fulfilling experience. And just to get up every morning and uh, at the resort and have the sunrise uh, was such a peaceful time. It, uh, it made me think a lot about the land and about what, what is meaningful to me in my home state, in my hometown. And if I could have half the energy, enthusiasm, and love for the land and everybody else, I would feel like I'm a happy man if I could go back and read and live the way that you guys live. You know, I, I know how much these people out here love to talk. We had actually scheduled seven minute uh, presentations. <laughs> but before I give, give my uh, thanks for everyone, are, are there any more questions or comments from you? Because I, I don't think we're wrapping this up yet. It kind of seems like we might be. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I guess uh, I guess I'll give you my thanks. I mean, I'm a, I'm a man of few words, but I've really enjoyed the the time I've been able to spend here. And what? Um, oh, that, that's okay. We we're all we're all you know we're all relations here. Um, and it, it's been a very eye-opening experience. Um, you know. I've, only been to the West Coast twice in my life, coming out of Central Illinois and Minnesota originally. Um, and I've had two new seafood treats, clams and oysters tonight, and they're and they're staying down. So you know, kind of go with the whole experience, you know. I didn't know what I was getting into when I came out here, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I made it because it's been a, a really great experience, and I'm glad we've been able to do what we can. Hopefully, the geek, which is an acronym that I didn't actually coin, um, because, you know, one of the issues was that people really said that, you know, maybe we shouldn't, maybe a club is too, uh, you know, people, people will think it's not independent enough, so... I actually came up with the term of, I believe it was a loose confederacy of citizens concerned about energy consumption. <laughs> but but that, didn't, that didn't acronymize very much. So, um, so, so we left it. But anyways, it's been great, and um, you know maybe I'll be back to the West Coast someday. Who knows? <laughs> Well, you know my story. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm just saying so long for a while because I'll be back in, in about a month. <laughs> so I will see you all. Well, thank you very much. And I want to give Ross a chance to make a little presentation here for the final event of this evening. As a very small token of our appreciation to you, uh, we've put together these little gift baskets that um, 
contain, you can help me distribute these, it's their own name. They are um, uh, convenient canvas bags from Anderson's store. They contain a pound of Weymouth Sunrise coffee from Gary Davis, a bookmark, um, an agate, a cup from the store. Uh, the, the, the coveted smell tuna. <laughs> we don't have coveted, so you need to lock this up or you will be attacked. Uh, the wonderful quince uh, jam jelly from Edith's um, Orchard. Um, a lovely uh, card of Guaymas Island Fairy Dock. <laughs> and a notepad for you. So this is just a little bit, I hope, you know, just so that you know, this was not a fairy tale, this was... <laughs>